Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Jim Mazzara. Dr. Mazzara did his medical school training at New York Medical College. He then went on to complete an orthopedic residency at St. Luke Roosevelt Hospital, which is a teaching hospital affiliate of Columbia University. Good morning, Dr. Mazzara. Good morning. Dr. Mazzara, what I'd like to discuss over the next few minutes is a condition called cubital tunnel syndrome. Now, what that, what that means is that it's a condition of the elbow that we know as ulnar nerve um, uh, compression here. We mm -hmm. call it cubital tunnel syndrome, it goes by other names. But talk to us a little bit about what that condition is and what symptoms it causes. Well, a cubital tunnel is, is actually compression or irritation of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. It's a very precise area where the ulnar nerve courses right in the back of the inside of the elbow. Patients commonly refer to that as their funny bone. So when you hit that hard enough, what you're really hitting is the ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel. And what happens for a variety of reasons is that something is going to cause pressure or swelling around the nerve. And that pressure or swelling around the nerve will cause the nerve to malfunction. When a nerve malfunctions, a couple of things will happen. One is either you'll experience numbness or tingling, which is generally an early phase and a milder form of cubital tunnel. You can eventually get and develop weakness. And the weakness is actually noticed by patients in loss of hand dexterity. So they might notice that as they do very simple tasks with their hand and their fingers, it's not as strong or they're not as, they don't function as normally as they used to. And, and so patients under those circumstances are sometimes found to have nerve injuries at the elbow. They can have nerve injuries elsewhere as well, but one of the potential causes for that is at the elbow. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think causes that compression on the nerve. I mean, is this always an injury? Is this something that can occur over a period of time? Why do we get compression in the cubital tunnel? Well, anytime you have any kind of swelling around the nerve, you'll get pressure on the nerve, and that pressure causes symptoms. And different things like diabetes, inflammatory arthritis, like a rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid dysfunction, as well as trauma. So previous trauma and recent trauma can cause swelling and damage and pressure on the nerve. People who lean on the elbow, uh, people who have trauma to the elbow for one reason or another can cause a lot of bleeding, swelling, and scarring around the nerve itself. When that occurs, there's a little ligament at the elbow. Uh, there is a small curved tunnel and a small ligament over that curved tunnel called Osborne's ligament. Something ends up squeezing the nerve. So whether it's thickening or scarring in Osborne's ligament, swelling of the nerve, or even arthritis in the joint underneath, that pressure will cause a problem with the nerve. And patients notice that, as I mentioned, with numbness, tingling, or eventually weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned uh, trauma. And one of the things that I think we ought to bring up for patients is sometimes uh, children who've had elbow fractures, and then that elbow fracture has healed in an abnormal position, will actually cause a little more angle in the elbow. And over a period of time, that may lead to problems just because that elbow is no longer normal. So it may be 20 years after the original trauma. That, that that's, that's very true. That's actually called the tardy on the nerve palsy. And over a period of time, people will develop problems as they get a little bit older. But that's really related to previous scar around the nerve and sometimes extra tension on the nerve. Uh, the nerve has a normal excursion. The nerve needs to be able to slide back and forth through the tunnel. Just like with, with any physiologic structure, it has to have normal environment. When that environment around the nerve is, has been changed for one reason or another, you, you get symptoms as a result of that. Now, you know, we, we all see patients who come into the office who co are complaining of my hands falling asleep. They wake up at night with it falling asleep. They really come in, they say, no, it's my whole hand. They can't really distinguish. How do I, as a patient, begin to do a little bit of self-diagnosis and begin to explore what is causing this and distinguish this from other nerve compression problems in the hand for us? Well, well first of all, when you have a compressed nerve, it, the symptoms are sometimes vague and nondescript, and it can be associated with an aching in the arm. Uh, if you have numbness or tingling, what you really want to notice is, is that numbness tingling in all of your fingers? Or is it, does it just feel like it's in all of your fingers? Typically, all the fingers aren't affected. If you have numbness and tingling in the thumb, index, middle finger, and maybe part of the ring finger, that's typically going to be carpal tunnel syndrome. Numbness and tingling of the little finger, if it's in the arm, it's going to be cubital tunnel. So when your little finger is involved, it's cubital tunnel. When it's the other fingers, it's actually carpal tunnel. You also have to be concerned about assigning 
the diagnosis of cubital tunnel or carpal tunnel when you have numbness in your fingers because the same nerves that get compressed at your elbow and your wrist come out of your neck. And so the nerve can be compressed in the cervical spine and through either a herniated disc or a bone spur. And there's a condition called the double crush phenomenon where patients will have pressure on the nerve in two locations. So pressure on the nerve in the neck predisposes somebody to get carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel at the elbow with less pressure on the nerve at the elbow. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think sometimes patients think somehow the human body is different than things they're normally associated with. But really, our, our nervous system is like any other wiring harness to some degree. And a lot of times, it's, it's a concept of trying to figure out where that wiring harness is getting interrupted. And it can be in multiple places. So although we give these names to things, we're really trying to figure out where is the nerve being compressed Right. and what are we going to do about it? Absolutely. Now tell me a little bit about the symptoms. You, you mentioned the numbness. What other symptoms is a patient who's having compression at the cubital tunnel likely going to, to feel? Well, if, if it's early on and they don't have advanced nerve injury, uh, they may have some aching in the arm. It may bother them sometimes when they sleep and they have to straighten the elbow when they sleep. Uh, it, it can, it's sometimes not very specific. It doesn't always go down to the hand, however. So patients who have a compression neuropathy in the elbow or even in the wrist may have symptoms that sometimes go up as far as the shoulder or neck. So it's not isolated to the elbow in itself. When you have pressure on the nerve at the elbow, it's your numbness and tingling will typically be on, on the outside of the fifth finger, top or bottom of the fifth finger. But you may also develop weakness over a period of time, and that weakness involves sometimes an inability to get all the fingers together. So that is an indication of more advanced disease. So if you have intrinsic wasting or wasting of the little muscles in the hand, you may end up seeing a little atrophy or indentation on this side of your hand, and you may also have some weakness in getting those fingers together. In addition, you may also have some weakness in trying to keep the fingers straight. When you have on the nerve related weakness, you may get what's called pseudo-clawing of the fingers where these fingers are not able to be maintained in a straight position because of the weakness of these small muscles and they, they extend like that a little bit. More advanced cases of on the nerve injury may also be associated with some weakness or atrophy between the thumb and the index finger. And this atrophy may result in some weakness and pinch. So that's where the dexterity issue becomes an issue for patients because Patients who cannot pick up something with the index finger and the thumb may say, well, Jim, I'm getting a little clumsy. I must, uh, either I'm getting old or I have arthritis or there's something else going on. Sometimes it's loss of dexterity from nerve injury at the elbow. Now, when that patient presents to your office, what do you do to try to make this diagnosis? How do you try to narrow down what's causing their problem? Well, you always have to start at the cervical spine, evaluate the, the neck. You take a great history. You get all the details you can. Since we know medications can cause nerve-related symptoms, we want to ask patients what medications they're on. We need to examine their cervical spine, check, the, check their reflexes, and then check their motor and sensory exam, which means we may go to the point of using a uh, sensory tester in the hand. More often than not, what I'll do is take a little wisp of exam paper from the exam table and just kind of stroke the tip of the finger to see if their sensation is the same in the little finger as it is in the index and how is it on the left hand compared to the right. Then we want to range their neck and just make sure that we're not missing anything elsewhere. And then we put a little pressure on the nerve at the elbow. We probably go to this last here. We want to make sure we've not missed anything else and then we examine the elbow itself. We examine the elbow for a range of motion, for appearance, for swelling, and then we tap at the ulnar nerve at the elbow, at the cubital tunnel in here, and then it might hold the elbow in a little degree of flexion and put a little pressure right over the ulnar nerve and then time that. And that's, that's a test that if the patient develops the onset of numbness or tingling, within sometimes a minute or two, they may have some swelling or irritation at the ulnar nerve at the elbow. A normal nerve will not necessarily become numb and tingly over a, short, over a few seconds. A more inflamed, compressed nerve certainly will. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I do, you know, patients will a lot of times present when these symptoms are coming and going. They're not there all the time. And it's, sometimes it's very difficult to sort of make that decision of what's going on because you can't see anything at the mm -hmm. time. Um, imaging studies. I mean, is there any role for any type of imaging, whether it's x-ray, MRI scan, anything to help make this diagnosis? 
If you think it's exclusively located at the elbow, I'll do an x-ray of the elbow to make sure we're not missing some arthritis. On the other hand, if you think it's at the neck or a potential for there to be nerve compression at the neck, you need to do an x-ray of the cervical spine. I'll occasionally do an, a, an MRI of the cervical spine if I think there's the slightest possibility of somebody have a nerve, having a nerve compressed elsewhere. In addition to that, uh, I don't think an MRI of the elbow is necessary, but I will always do a nerve conduction test. So an EMG nerve conduction study will tell me fairly precisely where the nerve is compressed, including whether or not it's compressed in the neck, and how severely it's compressed, and whether or not there's any nerve damage. And if so, how much is there? Is it mild compression of the nerve, or is it more advanced compression of the nerve, where some of the fibers or filaments in the nerve, some of the individual nerve, nerve fibers themselves have started to die? And that's a more significant finding because that really indicates that any treatment you have has to be directed to a more advanced degree of nerve damage, and the outcome of that may be different than if it's very mild nerve damage. Well, let's talk a little bit about treatment, and, and let's start with what are our options for conservative treatment? Uh, medications, physical therapy, what works? Well, what I've found is that the use of anti-inflammatories can be very helpful. I commonly ask patients to try to try to avoid putting pressure on the elbow, so leaning with the arm down is generally not a good idea if you have ulnar neuropathy. Uh, physical therapy I've not really found to be very helpful. I don't use injections in this area. I don't find that to be very helpful at all. Uh, at sometimes at night I'll ask patients to wear a little padded elbow brace at night, a little gentle reminder that they shouldn't be bending their elbow when they sleep, but that's very hard for patients to do. Yeah, I find that patients really uh, resist those, those splints. Yeah. Uh, it'll work if you can sleep with your arm out straight, but you can't sleep, so right. you sort of created another problem for them for the right. most part. Um, when should a person be concerned and begin considering whether or not this needs surgery to decompress that nerve? Well, that really requires that we break down patients into separate categories. So if there's mild, moderate, and more advanced degrees of nerve damage, patients who have milder forms of nerve compression at the elbow may get better with activity modification and, and uh, anti-inflammatories in a little bit of time. Those people generally don't need surgery. Uh, if they get better over a short period of time, they don't even need to have a nerve conduction test. Patients who may have seen continuing symptoms, even with modified activity and anti-inflammatories and maybe that splint that we referred to, generally going to need a nerve conduction test. And if they have some evidence of pressure on the nerve, they become a candidate for a decompression of that nerve. People who have more advanced degrees of nerve damage, who have some suggestion that there's some death of the individual nerve fibers, potentially permanent damage of those nerve fibers in the, at the, uh, on the nerve at the elbow, really need to think seriously about having that nerve treated surgically, because they're just not going to get better with bracing in time and anti-inflammatories. And to not treat those people surgically, really, or at least offer them surgically, really means that they have permanent damage which guaranteed will get worse. Now, if you take that last group of patients with advanced nerve damage, the best you can tell those people sometimes is that uh, we can decompress your nerve. If everything goes well, it won't get worse. Can't really promise them they're going to get better, though. Right. Now, in terms of, of the actual operation, I know there's many different ways described in our surgical literature, and people use different techniques to decompress the ulnar nerve. What's your approach to surgery on the ulnar nerve? Well, studies look at the different techniques that we offer patients, and uh, every once in a while, some study will come out and say, this technique is better than that technique. Recently, there was a study that was reviewed in our orthopedic journal that it says they're all pretty comparable. Um, and of the three major treatment options, uh, my own preference is to do a decompression or what's called a medial epicondylectomy. And what that does is you actually go into the area where the nerve is at the elbow through a small incision. And for very mild forms or moderate forms of uh, degrees of cubital tunnel, just decompressing the nerve, releasing it, and removing a little bump on the bone called the medial epicondyle and mobilizing that nerve forward can be very, very effective. In those patients, one of the downsides of that is that the nerve is then on the, uh, on the inside of the elbow. It's under the skin, but can be a source of irritation for some patients. 
There's a, a, another technique called a subcutaneous decompression, which I, I don't normally do because I, I find that those people have a potential increased rate of recurrence. And the procedure that I prefer to do is called a submuscular transposition of the ulnar nerve, which, which actually allows me to take the ulnar nerve and put it under the muscle where I think it has the best chance at healing, at recovering, and has the lowest chance of being a source of irritation for patients because it's protected by muscle and tendon. And when we look at patients who actually need revisions of cubital tunnel surgery previously performed, almost everybody agrees that those people end up needing a submuscular transposition of the nerve because that's where the nerve seems to do the best. Well, my own philosophy is if the nerve does well there for a revision, it should do well there for a first time around, and I think many of those patients seem to do very well. How, how do you make the decision whether you proceed on initially with a submuscular transposition or whether you do the medial epicondylectomy? I think for very mild to moderate forms of uh, cubital tunnel in somebody who I don't think is at risk for having irritation of the nerve, I'll recommend and offer a decompression and a medial epicondylectomy. You just remove a little portion of the medial epicondyle, it's not the whole portion of the bone because that would destabilize the joint. But there's a technique for doing that. It allows us to take some tension off the nerve and free it up. For patients who I think are going back to more physical kinds of tasks, who may have more advanced degrees of nerve injury, I think those are people who would end up doing better with a submuscular transposition. Now there are different versions of the submuscular transposition. The one I do uh, puts the nerve in the front of the elbow where it's under no tension whatsoever and we do a lengthening of the tendon. So what we'll actually do is we'll move the muscle and tendon down but we cut the tendon in such a way where we can actually reattach it but it's longer. So there's less tension, there's no chance for that nerve to be under any pressure at that point. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the recovery time for these two procedures. Uh, what is a patient expecting? I'm assuming that this is still being done as an outpatient procedure. It is, yeah. These patients are not staying in the hospital. Uh, uh, it, it's an outpatient procedure. The uh, patients are generally given a bulky dressing for a week or so, sometimes a little bit less for the medial epicondylectomy and the debridement. Those people can get moving fairly quickly. When we do the submuscular transposition, I might put them in a padded dressing for about a week or so, but then they start moving fairly quickly after that. I, I generally don't let them do any heavy work for sometimes four to six weeks, but they can do lighter activities sooner than that, much sooner than that. Now, are they going to need any sort of physical therapy after this, or do these people recover on their own? Sometimes they need physical therapy. They go back, they work with the therapist to get their motion back, and uh, the, the motion comes back very, very quickly. The strength takes a little bit longer uh, because th the tendons that are attached up here tend to take a little bit of time to recover. Mm -hmm. Now what about nerve damage? What are we talking about when we're, when we're monitoring these patients after surgery? How long do you think it's going to take for us to see any change in that nerve? If the nerve is going to get better, how long is that going to take? And when do we finally give up and say, you know, we stopped the process, but we don't think you're going to get any better? It, it depends on the degree of nerve damage. Many patients will come back after surgery and all of their pre-op symptoms are gone. And they're gone because the nerve was not permanently damaged. So taking the pressure off the nerve, decompressing that nerve or translocating that nerve makes all the difference in the world. Those people come back and their elbow hurts from having the surgery, but their fingers and the hand feel normal. When they have more advanced degrees of nerve damage, some of those people, people may come back and make come back after surgery and say, well, the aching in the arm is gone, but my fingers are still numb and it. my hand is still weak. That nerve will take a year, maybe two, to fully recover depending on the degree of nerve damage. So you're, you're telling people at this point that don't give up hope yet, yeah. and it could take a while. It, it can take quite a while depending on the degree of nerve injury. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that, that sometimes what I'll tell patients is I, I think we've got pretty good evidence that nerves grow at about two millimeters a day if they're starting to grow back. Yep. So if you cut a nerve and repair it, you're expecting it to sort of move two millimeters a day. And it takes a while, probably six to eight weeks for that process to start before that it starts. Exactly right. So sometimes I'll sort of do this process where I'll measure and I'll say, well, this is sort of what I would expect. And it could be anywhere around that, but this is the way I'm gauging what I'm trying, what I'm telling you. I, I would agree. I, I would tend to be a little bit more uh, conservative. I, I tell them a millimeter a day, that gives me a, a little bit of time to allow those patients to expect recovery. And I think that a millimeter to two a day is not unrealistic. 
but it's not immediate. Mm -hmm. Okay, the nerve has the potential to regenerate, but it it never quite gets back to perfection. Uh, it can get better, but to promise a patient who's got really advanced nerve damage a normal outcome, not always a realistic thing. Uh, pe people will recover tremendously following this kind of surgery, but not always to perfection. Yeah. Well, I think the best advice we can give patients is have patience. And don't wait so long. And don't wait so long. Don't wait to, so long. Before they have the surgery. Yeah. 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 Um, do you ever, just curiosity, do you ever do a repeat nerve conduction velocity to try to see if and show the patient that, that actually the nerve is repairing itself? Is that any use to you? Uh, I, I generally don't do that to demonstrate to the patient that the nerve is recovering. Uh, unless there's another issue at hand that I'm concerned about injury to the nerve itself. Mm -hmm. If I'm concerned about injury to the nerve itself or scar tissue in the nerve itself, I might do that. If I'm considering a second exploration of the nerve because the patient for a period of time has not seen any improvement, then we may go and do a nerve test to see if there's any change from the previous EMG nerve conduction test. Mm -hmm. And so going in and, and sometimes decompressing the nerve itself can be beneficial for those patients. but. In many cases, that's not going to be a lot of help. Well, let's talk about just some of the things that can go wrong with an operation like this. I think we've, met, we've mentioned the fact that uh, even if the surgery is done pristinely, you still may not get better. We yeah. may still feel that it's successful that we've stopped the process. But I'm assuming like this, this like other types of surgery, has potential complications. What do you worry about as an orthopedic surgeon? Well, you're operating on the nerve, and you're always worried about nerve injury. So the things we worry about are nerve damage, uh, and that's a, an issue for concern in any instance where you're doing any kind of nerve decompression. And even though we know where the nerve is and we're extremely careful, uh, any, any kind of nerve that is injured or under tension in the first place is very sensitive and very prone to manipulation. So it's much more likely to, to become injured if there's a little bit of t extra tension on it. Uh, bleeding. Bleeding is always a concern. Sometimes bleeding will occur in the area, and in particular if somebody's doing a submuscular transposition, uh, there might be a little bit more bleeding following that surgery. Uh, some patients will have bleeding that actually goes down the arm. They look like they're quite bruised. That generally recovers very, very quickly and is not a long-term concern for the majority of those patients. Infection, risk of any surgery. And I guess the, the biggest concern is outcome. You have to have realistic expectations. If your nerve is very badly damaged, you can't expect perfection. If it's mild and you're getting to it early on in the process, you can expect a much better result. And then there's always risk of recurrence, recurrent nerve compression, irritation of the nerve. Um, when you look at the studies that seem to analyze the rate of recurrence, one of the studies that, that was published in 2003 would indicate that the lowest rate for recurrence is with the submuscular transposition with the lengthening of the tendon. And in fact, that's the procedure I do in, in majority of the patients that I see. Any other complications that we should discuss uh, that are potential problems with this operation? Uh, one other thing that, that we see in some patients is sometimes a, a, an injury to the branch of the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. In English, what that really means is that there's a very, very tiny branch, sensory branch of a nerve over here on the inside of the elbow. In some patients, that branch of the nerve is, is either directly in the way of the transposition of the big on the nerve. In most patients, we can preserve that and protect it and move it out of the way. In some patients, we may have to sacrifice a small branch. Some people may have a little area of numbness on the inside of the elbow. Nobody ever really complains about that. It doesn't really bother patients, but it's something that I counsel patients on preoperatively. So if they come back and their hand feels better and there's a little numb area on the inside of their elbow or forearm, they're not overly, overly concerned about that. And, and we, we know that happens, but it's not a big issue. Okay. Well, thanks for an interesting discussion about a very, a very uh, common problem in the, in the elbow. Any last minute advice you would have to patients who may be uh, looking for a physician to take care of this, they suspect they have uh, a problem in their elbow with their cubital tunnel, what should they be looking for in a surgeon? Well, I think you need to see somebody who has a lot of experience and special interest in treating this condition. I would tell you that not every orthopedic surgeon will treat cubital tunnel syndrome surgically. Uh, not everybody's got uh, a vast background and experience in treating this particular condition. And you really have to understand that if a nerve is under pressure and it's injured, the longer you wait, the more likely that nerve is to develop permanent damage, potentially leading to 
a less, out, less optimal outcome when you eventually decide to have treatment. So if you have nerve injury in the arm and elbow, you really don't want to wait till it's permanently damaged because the results may not be as good as you would like. So this is not a condition that you want to sort of say it'll go away and I'll just live with it for a while. I think when your fingers are numb and tingly and your hand is weak, that's a reason to be concerned and get an evaluation. I think that sounds like good advice. Thank you very much. Thank you.